This is probably the most unlikely subject that I would ever talk on. If somebody would tell me that I was going to talk on prosperity gospel, I would laugh because I would never, except for a long rant, speak on that. But here I am. I read something today that came in from an author named Joseph Z, just the letter Z. He has his own ministry in Colorado. And he's an author, a broadcaster, a Bible teacher, and an international prophetic voice. And it says, before the age of nine, he began encountering the voice of God through dreams and visions and dedicated his life to preaching the gospel around the world. So he has quite a bit of history and a lot of world experience. And he has written a new book. And his new book is called Breaking Hell's Economy. And so none of that interested me until I read what he had written under to speak about the nature of his book. And so I'm not going to try to rewrite it. I'm going to use a lot of what he said to explain what he's saying. And I will put the link to this book and this content in the comments so that you can see it for yourself. But it hit on an interesting subject and it said some interesting things about it that I really um, was happy I read and it brought a lot of clarity to something that I probably didn't have a good way of speaking to before. But Joseph Z says, right now it is urgent to break free from what is the world's economy. He says that there's a war being fought over every one of us and the kingdom of God will offer us divine provision while the kingdom of hell is fighting for territory in our lives as a crisis looms for the entire world right now. And he says, we're rapidly plunging into global difficulties involving worldwide market collapse, bank closures, a digital one world currency, power grids failing, cyber war, medical deception, natural catastrophes, and unprecedented international conflict. Almost all of those are going on. And in Breaking Hell's Economy, he makes it clear that we're at a destination in history that requires a revelation of God's supernatural economy and that it will be our ultimate defense against the darkness that is rising. And we, if you read the Bible, you know that this is where that, that's happening. He wrote an article on this subject and it was called Remove the Devil's Curse from Your Wallet because he's speaking on economy, which is the thing everybody remains consumed with when there's all this stuff going on. I mean, we still have a pandemic. I There's as many people with COVID now as any other time. Just, I, I'm just perplexed by this. There's so many with it and uh, everything changes about how that's handled, but there's many things that have great risk happening around us, but most people, their top, top concern is finances. And God's supernatural kingdom operates on a supernatural system because he intends to impact our world. And that system includes economics. It has always been the goal of the devil to completely run the world. And the devil, for some reason, didn't seem to understand what Jesus came to do. And more significantly, the devil certainly never saw the church coming. He did not see the church and its purpose. That was a surprise to him. And it was a concept that was concealed or hidden in the Old Testament because he didn't pick up on it. 
that Jesus hit the kingdom of darkness with something it was not equipped to handle us. We are God's ultimate plan to destroy the system of the devil. And as he is in the world, so are we, meaning Jesus. We are his extension in the world right now, if we choose to be. You can look at the impact of your life and you will know that you are either an extension for Jesus or you are lukewarm and you will be um, cast out. So you're either in it or you're not. God has a plan to finance the gospel around the globe. And I think all of us who are in the, the midst of of working to share the gospel every which way we can. We know which way we can and the changing which ways we can't and which social media start cracking down and on what words and we know where these things keep shifting. But we also know that if we've been given such a precious and great mandate to share the story of Jesus Christ with the world, there is no higher call than that. There is no higher purpose for a man or a woman. There is nothing that is greater than carrying that message to others. And Jesus is looking for anyone and everyone who is passionate about getting his message out to every lost person of his. We all started with him, but we're all not going to end with him. And he wants as many as will come to spend eternity with him. And we should remember that the Lord, he is, he will give power to get wealth that he may establish his covenant, which he swore to his fathers as it is this day, Deuteronomy 8.18. So God himself speaks of that but it's for a purpose to spread his message that's why he would create wealth for someone the ultimate covenant promise is the gospel he wants the gospel to be established and when combining this promise with the great commission we see that he wants his covenant to be established around the world until everyone has heard and I know people who try to measure that as how much time do I have left as not following Jesus. They use it as a marker on the clock. How much of the world doesn't know Jesus? I seriously have heard people ask that question for that reason. There's something God will empower and give supernatural favor and finance to do, and that is to move the gospel. And God's economic plan for the gospel is often very misunderstood. If viewed as a way to simply have more money, where people move into ministry, they start raising funds to have more money, they have fallen into the trap of Satan. If that's the case, if they just want more money, anyone who is working under the umbrella of ministry title, who is just seeking more funds, has fallen into the worst trap they could possibly fall into. And the deception is so great that you can't tell them anything. You can't even talk them out of what they're doing. God blessed Adam and instructed him to be fruitful and multiply and to take dominion over the earth. Satan then hijacked that blessing and counterfeited it with mammon but Jesus won it back on the cross. Hell's economy is simply money, power, and influence, which is the agenda of the Antichrist. That's it. That's the whole agenda of the Antichrist. Wealth and power, just for wealth and power's sake. It's an indulgence into selfishness, which is to corporate, cooperate with a Luciferian system. So hell's economy is absent of the Spirit of God, and it knows no other abundance but accumulating more and more for self. No joy, no satisfaction from the inside out, 
and no answers to the fight on the inside, just more and more and accumulating more and looking at what we have and figuring out how to get more. That is why this lust is so tormenting. It's a desire that is never resolved. It's a striving that has no solution. And you can set out to make this much, but when you make this much, then you're like, oh, well, we can take it to here. And it just is a hamster wheel that continuously throws you off and you run right back and get on. Lust has no resolve. Lust and mammon go hand in hand. Lust will pollute the idea of God's economy and supernatural increase through the cloak of mammon, which again is man striving for the sole purpose of possessing money, power, and all other counterfeits that make up hell's economy. Matthew 6, 24 says, no one can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or else he will be loyal to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and mammon. And mammon, isn't money. Mammon is the worship of money. It's placing all of your faith in money and removing reliance upon God. It's a counterfeit blessing. It's a fake blessing. Mammon is the devil's economy and it strives in the flesh for wealth and resources designed to prevent you from functioning in your true blessing. So if you fall for the lie, and you start accumulating wealth for the sake of wealth and appearance and power and whatever it is that you're trying to get from that that is not advancing the gospel, you know if you're advancing the gospel or not. You can craft that any which way you want, but you know if you're advancing the gospel in your motives, in your heart, or not. Either way, if you take that road around that to... Um, excusing yourself to make more money for yourself. That deception is going to be very hard to break out of because there's such strong delusion that comes with that because it's so intentional. It's so intentional to bless self rather than blessing Jesus. And what most know as the prosperity gospel, which is also known as the word of faith movement, that gospel believes that the believer is told to use God to meet his desires. And the truth of biblical Christianity and prosperity is exactly the opposite of that. God uses the believer and his finances for his own, God's desires. They're totally opposite of each other. And the false prosperity gospel sees the Holy Spirit as a special tool or a vehicle to acquire whatever our heart desires in the flesh. The Bible teaches that the Holy Spirit is a person who enables the believer to do God's will. That's the purpose of the Holy Spirit. Point us to Jesus, help us to become more like Jesus all the time, and to be Jesus here on earth. The prosperity gospel runs parallel to very, a good number of very destructive sects back in the early church that were all based on greed. Paul and other apostles were very oppositional to these false teachers. They identified them as dangerous false teachers and they urged everyone to avoid them. Paul warned Timothy in 1 Timothy 6, 5 and 9, 11, 9 through 11. These men of corrupt mind supposed godliness was a means of gain and their desire for riches was a trap that brought them into ruin and destruction. The pursuit of wealth is a dangerous path for Christians and one that God definitely warns us about. And he says in verse 10, for the love of money, not money, but the love of money is a root of all kinds of evil. Some people eager for money have wandered from the faith and pierced themselves with many griefs. A lot of people have done that. If riches were an acceptable goal for the godly, you can be sure Jesus would have pursued it. But he didn't. The Bible says he had no place to lay his head in Matthew 8.20. And he taught his disciples to live the same as he did. Disciples then and disciples now do not have a def 
definition any different. There's nowhere where we are expected to go out and function on some level as a rock star or a celebrity that is absolutely shameful to who Jesus was. The only disciple consumed with wealth was Judas, and he sold Jesus to death for the measly price of a slave just to have more money. Paul was desiring more for, Paul said desiring more for ourselves is idolatry. That's what the sin of idolatry is, is the fixation on self and acquiring more of whatever it is that we want. Ephesians 5.5 5, and instructed the Ephesians to avoid anyone who brought a message of immorality or desire for wealth or possessions in Ephesians 5, 6 through 7. So Paul told people to stay away from those who focused on those things. Prosperity teaching stops God from being able to work on his own as it's designed. It stops anyone from thinking that God can work on his own apart from us. It takes away the sovereignty piece of it. God is not Lord of all because he cannot work until we release the blessing to ourselves by our own act or our word of faith. We do not trust in God. We trust in faith. And faith is a formula through, through which we manipulate God, the God of the universe, to obey us. Faith in what we say, not in whom we trust, is the focus and the source. So instead of God is our source, God is our everything, we, those following the prosperity gospel, will point to faith as being the source, faith as being the vehicle by which you acquire everything of God. These prosperity teachers call it positive confession, saying that words themselves have creative power to get things from God. And what words you use to say things determine everything about what happens to you in your life. And the blessings you demand of God must all be stated positively and with a steady voice. You cannot be in any kind of disbelief, unbelief, because that isn't faith, therefore you will not get what you're asking for. And then they feel if you do present this in a steady, correct way, God is obligated by his word to answer. So God's ability to bless us hangs on our faith, period. That is complete heresy, by the way. James 4, 13 through 16 clearly contradicts this teaching. It says, now listen, you who say, today or tomorrow we will go to this or that city, spend a year there, carry on business and make money. Why, you don't even know what will happen tomorrow. What is your life? You're a mist that appears for a little while and then vanishes. Far from speaking things into existence in the future, we don't even know what tomorrow is going to bring or even whether we will be alive tomorrow. It doesn't matter who you are. It doesn't matter what kind of faith concoction you have presented all your life as far as I say the right things, my faith is correct to demand on God, we will still die, we will still face judgment, and it will be the same, the same judgment. Instead of focusing on the importance of wealth, the Bible warns against the pursuit of wealth. Christians are to be free from the love of money because the Bible says the love of money leads to all kinds of evil. That's what the Bible says. If you love money, it will lead you to all kinds of evil. And I think we all know that. We have seen that in enough people. Corruption is centered around money. Jesus warned, watch out, be on your guard against all kinds of greed. A man's life does not consist in the abundance of his possessions. Luke 12, 15. The opposite gospel of prosperity, the way that the Bible says prosperity, because it does say that, 
parks on gaining money and possessions in this life when Jesus says, do not store up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy, where thieves break in and steal, Matthew 6, 19. Jesus himself directly confronts that and says, don't do it. The contradictions between prosperity teaching and the gospel of Jesus, which also allows for the prosperity, he has his own version of prosperity, are settled firmly by the words of Jesus in Matthew 6, 24. You cannot serve both God and money. He, that's that simple. Teachings on poverty are often far more extreme than teachings on prosperity. Sadly, it's, it's almost heroic for some people to claim poverty. They just, their, their pride is almost in their poverty. But this also aligns with hell's economy. Poverty does. This is carnal and logical to the world, but it is opposite of God's economy. Mammon, the love and worship of money, is humanistic. It's striving after the flesh with no regard for God. It's going after money, but it's never seeking first the kingdom of God. Mammon is having one desire only to possess wealth and power, meeting your own needs before meeting the needs of God and others. The purpose of mammon is not to use our gathering for God's plan and purpose, but for oneself. That is exactly what God condemns, what he calls Luciferian economy. So if you are in that of acquiring things and wealth for yourself and you're not pushing the the blessings that are up and over to the kingdom, you're actually serving the devil's economy. But poverty, people think, is somehow acceptable because it's not um, lavished in riches. It's not this other thing that they condemn. But God does not support that either. Poverty, actually like prosperity, depends on the context in which you're using it because you can be poverty of spirit and be very wealthy in finances. So it would be a terrible position to be in to have tremendous earthly wealth but have poverty of spirit because your life at the end is the end. You will no longer have wealth. Your body will leave and go to a grave and your, you will, the rest goes to hell. Nothing is going with you. This Babylonian system of selfish gain is not Bible prosperity. And it also means don't place poverty in an acceptable bracket either for God because he does he can't do anything with that either. Even though you may appear to be increasing in some people say as they get more steady, as they get more money, then they can look more like they're serving God. But as you spend money on all the new things, the newest cars, the newest things, the newest, bigger houses, the possessions, if you are not experiencing the sweetness of blessing from Jesus, you're on the wrong path with that. Because if you're doing the right thing with the prosperity of your finances, God chose to bless you with more finances all the money is his he chose to put it in your hands to test you to see if you would turn completely selfish or if you would hand it back to him to grow his kingdom he's giving you a choice and too too many will take what he hands them the excess and they will pursue pleasure, they will pursue a name, they will pursue vacations, they will pursue all kinds of things 
but they will not pursue growing evangelistic efforts to reach the lost. That's what they don't spend their money on. We must always dismiss mammon, knowing that the word of God says you cannot serve him and it at the same time. You cannot have both. So you either support God's mission or you support your mission. Mammon is yours. You can say you're Christian all day long, but in the end, when God shows you all the money he gave you, and then he shows you how much of it you gave back to him, you won't have anything to say that day. You will see exactly what you did. You cannot serve both. Instead, we are to seek first the kingdom and his righteousness, which are only found in Jesus. And when you seek righteousness, peace, and joy through Jesus, he becomes your desire. So when people throw that verse out about God giving you the desires of your heart, he intended for it to be himself. That's what he meant by that. He intended it to be himself not something else that you wanted more than him. If it's not him that you desire, don't be throwing that verse around like God's going to make that happen because you have really offended him. If God is your desire, then you will be filled with righteousness, peace, and joy with no sorrow added. The body of Christ has been misled to believe that you can't have money if you're in ministry. But that's not true either. When you seek the, seek the kingdom of God first, there's this supernatural blessing of God released onto you. If you are pursuing Christ and, and his, his purpose and plan for you, there is a supernatural blessing if you're doing that according to his plan. Even in the Old Testament, he spoke blessings over Adam, Abraham, Jacob, David, who all wanted to build a house for him, but instead God built the house for David. We can engage our blessing with our faith through giving, standing up, confessing, and never allowing ourselves to love money. Once you come to the point where you love money, and you love the difference it can make in your life. You love living in the excess. You love what kind of social group it brings you into. You sadly have cast Jesus and his kingdom purposes to the side so that you can live in a life that actually, for the most part, forsakes him. Instead of living in fear of what could happen if you keep living that way, live out your faith by being a radical giver. All of what you have belongs to God anyway, and he's the one watching our ledger. Even if we don't keep a ledger, he's watching the ledger because he can see if our life is more important to us than saving others from hell for all eternity. He's watching the ledger. He knows what we're bringing in. Yes, he knows we work hard for that money, but he also knows all that money is his. He also knows he's the only way to heaven for us, so we can't sit here and demand on anything like this is my money, I made it. Yeah, no, we have nothing apart from Christ. So if you have money coming in, God has blessed you. He's watching what you do with every cent of that money. Every penny and every moment of your time will show up on one side or the other on Judgment Day. Self or kingdom work. It's going to be one way or the other. You will see it clearly. And we must start with the recognition that all of creation belongs to God. He owns everything and it's his choice what he does with it. He's good, and he desires to give us good things. He's already proven that by giving us his best thing, Jesus. And when we've accepted the gift of forgiveness provided by Jesus, 
and the honor of being adopted into God's family, something we certainly don't deserve, the creator of the universe becomes our father and he loves us as his own child. An earthly father wants to prosper his children. He wants them to become the best. He wants to give them good gifts for the most part. I know there are some fathers that don't, but for the most part, so does God. As his children, you can expect that he will take good care of you. Even if things go bad, God has promised his children. He will take care of them and provide for them. And this earth is not the end of the story. In case there's ways where you saw that not happen, this earth is just a vapor of the real story. The truth that God wants his children to know is that he does want to prosper his children, but his desire for us is to prosper in ways that may not include material wealth because he knows some of us would forget him. We'd completely abandon him if we were released to the option of a lot of material wealth. So prosperity in that case would not be material riches for those who can't handle it. First Timothy 6, 9 warns those who want to get rich fall into temptation and a trap and into many foolish and harmful desires that plunge people into ruin and destruction. And there are many types of prosperity of which material or financial prosperity could be an option, but there are other types that are far more important in God's eyes. God cannot trust very many actually with material or financial prosperity because many people make an idol of that. And Jesus even said in Luke 18, 24, how difficult it is for the rich to inherit the kingdom, kingdom of God because when given wealth, it quickly brings out a different person. If it doesn't happen right away, it does somehow happen. And if you watch the shows where people won the lottery and you look at what happens to their life, they all won the lottery and said, oh, I'm going to keep working my job. I'm going to give to the charity down the street. I'm going to do this and this and this. And then within a few years, their house is foreclosed on. All the vehicles are taken back and they're in a worse place than they were before they ever even won the lottery. And that is sadly what happens to most of them. It's just the way of human nature to be absolutely consumed by money and what it can do for you. So God will withhold it from many people because he knows what it will do to most of us. Um, he will give wealth to those who can be stewarded can steward it with his guidance and he will test others as well. He will give us money as a test to see if we can steward it properly. Prosperity can become a substitute for the real goal of pursuing God and his righteousness, sadly in too many cases. And God will wisely not give us what we clamor for, but instead give us what we truly need. He has our eternal benefit in mind, not our short-term comfort. So he's looking at our lives for eternity. So he may not give us that person that we're begging for and begging for and begging for because he sees where we're going to end up in this life. And we won't end up in heaven as a result of that choice. It is not earthly physical prosperity that provided that's provided by the atonement of Jesus. It's heavenly spiritual prosperity. That's the prosperity the Bible talks about. And some of God's most loyal servants suffered physical ailments that were not miraculously healed this, this side of eternity. And many believers all through history and many today are imprisoned, tortured, and killed for their faith. It says in Hebrews 11, 37 to 38, they went about in sheepskins and goatskins destitute, persecuted, and mistreated. They wandered in deserts and mountains, living in caves and in holes in the ground. The early church was not prosperous in money. They did not prosper in a lot of personal belongings, but they prospered in generosity, in love, and in fellowship with Christ and each other. And God created this world to be perfect he wanted us to enjoy perfect lives, perfect fellowship with him. He did intend for us to live in a prosperity state, 
But man allowed sin to enter and corrupt that plan. And now prosperity, health, and a peaceful life is very, very rarely possible for most people because this earth has tanked into just darkness by the hand of man in most cases. The fun reality of God's prosperity will be experienced when we leave this world and enter into eternity with Jesus. And Hebrews 11 lists dozens of faithful servants of God who one might expect to have lived prosperously because of their faithfulness. But verses 39 and 40 say, And all these, having gained approval through their faith, did not receive what was promised, because God had provided something better, so that apart from us they would not be made perfect. Every child of God, bought with the blood of Jesus Christ, will experience prosperity beyond our wildest imaginations for all of eternity, according to 1 Corinthians 2.9. So we walk by faith. We trust that God knows what prosperity needs to look like in each one of our lives so that the ultimate end is the best service for him, the most people gained for heaven, less people thrown into a lake of fire forever and eternity because we were faithful with what we were given here. Time and money are currency that are valuable here. Very, very rich people would give all their money to have more time. And many people give all of their time to have more money. Romans 8, 17 through 18 promises. Now, if we are children, then we are heirs, heirs of God, co-heirs with Christ. If indeed we share in his sufferings in order that we may also share in his glory, I consider that our present sufferings are not worth comparing with the glory that will be revealed in us. Being co-heirs with Christ means that we will enjoy everything God owns forever. No earthly prosperity can come close to that. There is absolutely no possible way to even describe it. Many outside the church get really offended about money in the church, the church asking for money, ministers getting paid, missionaries wanting money to keep being missionaries. There's some kind of a belief system that people think those in the work of the gospel should not have any money that they are their agreement to serve God should basically be a one of zero pay but this is a carnal viewpoint it reflects the desire and the plans of the devil who does want that to be true he does not want to see a person who's crazy passionate about Jesus having funds to blast that as far across the earth as they can. He sure doesn't want to see a church that is an actual Bible-believing church to prosper and reach multitudes for the gospel. So he propagates that viewpoint that the church should not be asking for money. All they do is ask for money. All they do is ask for money. I have people say that to me. Why do you ask for money? Well, when we put this out, it costs us money. I don't know if people realize that. We were talking last night, Toddy said, I don't think people realize it, but we do prayer ministry and we actually do it for free. And that's not very common, we know that, but we do it for free. And we also end up giving them probably the nicest Bible they could own and an audio Bible that they can leave playing in their house. So it actually costs us, it costs us quite a bit to do prayer ministry because we're so serious about them holding their ground and staying plugged in that we buy what they need so that they don't have to go home and then buy what they need because the chances are the devil will make sure they don't do that. We equip them to stand before they go out our door. So when we ask for money, we're trying to do prayer appointments as effectively as we can. But I do know that I hear that a lot, just the bitterness of people over 
over the church wanting money and i think that's crazy because nobody has a, the, those same people do not have an issue with the contract a professional ball player signs for millions and millions of dollars and he gives nothing to charity they don't have any problem with that but they have problems with the church asking for money as if the church is criminal in some way to do that that is something people will answer for if you have that judgment in your heart just know that your judgment is against God because the church belongs to him if you know a church is not handling finances well by all means don't give to them but you certainly are called to give to the work of God so find it and give to it otherwise there's going to be a big gap in what you have to say in the end when you're facing God and he shows you all the wealth you accumulated and how much you gave back to him for Christians we often find it more comfortable to believe God does not desire us to have wealth than to accept that he actually wants us to be blessed but people are mixing up two different concepts prosperity and mammon and you need to keep them separate that is what i loved about what this man was writing was prosperity and mammon are two completely different concepts and they need to be separated in the bible many argue tithing is not a new testament principle i see these arguments all the time too normally i don't weigh in on that because i tend to not want to get myself stuck in yuck over something that people just want to argue about it the point about tithing being in an argument is completely insane because why would you argue about that why would you argue about giving money to god how much why, why would you argue about that if you're going to argue about how much money you're giving to god well i don't want to give that much because i don't think the bible supports that i give that much okay remember everything belongs to him everything belongs to him so when you wrap your hands around it and you say well wait no this i'm keeping you have to remember that god is reading your thoughts it's all being recorded you're gonna face it in the future i would let go of everything because you are going to come to a moment very soon where you, you will wish you would have. You will wish you would have given it all. You will wish you would have. Heaven has levels. And those who did or were faithful, you probably won't even see them there because you were not. Some of you, not all, but some are not. When you're sowing in the natural realm, the Bible says Jesus receives it in the spirit realm. So you do not have to worry about where's that money going. I need to see the books of the church. Because if you truly are sowing into Jesus, the word for the right reasons, that's his business. You don't even have to worry. You gave of a heart towards God. And even if the place you gave it to does something wrong or criminal with it, your reward is still there. You can rejoice because it went through Jesus' economy because you intended that. That was your, that was your um, purpose. Hebrews 7, 8 says, Here mortal man receives tithes, tithes, but there Jesus receives them, of whom it is witness that he lives. First in the natural, then in the spiritual. We have to act our faith in the natural which then leads to a supernatural reaction and there are two areas involved in your giving that apply here and there principle first Corinthians 15 46 says how be it that um, was first that was not first which is spiritual but that which is natural and afterward that which is spiritual and simply it is saying you sow into the kingdom whether it be the tithe and offering or anything of value. And not only does it go into the storehouse, but it's supernaturally received by Jesus. Giving 
is a faith action that has a supernatural response attached to it. If you're giving to Jesus with the right heart. Grace is powerful. It teaches us who Christ is and who we are in him. Tithing, although not required to obtain grace, does unlock and protect what you possess. Tithing should not be based on fear of judgment because some teachings today say that if you do not tithe, you will be cursed, but the Bible actually doesn't say that. Galatians 3.13 says, Christ has redeemed us from the curse of the law. So he's redeemed us from the curse. The only thing remaining is blessing, which on topic of God's economy, we activate through tithing. Tithing is about being obedient to God's commands. We already have everything in the spirit due to Jesus' sacrifice on the cross, but we activate the blessings in the natural through our acts of faith. We are loaded with supernatural opportunities and favor when we act on what we have already received through the kingdom of God, which is everything, including our breath. It is simple. Give and you will receive. And how do you get there? First, you need to change your mind. In 3 John 1, 2, the Bible says, Beloved, I pray that you may prosper in all things and be in health just as your soul prospers. This soul prosperity includes your mind your will and your emotions and you will not receive beyond your level of believing the way you believe the Word of God <clears throat> is the way that you receive your blessing and if you do not understand how to believe and receive from the Word of God you will have a very limited blessing not just about finances this is about every way of your life which could be blessed and prospered Second, you live out your belief. When you believe the word of God, you begin to receive the word of God. And when you can stand in faith and believe God's will is to bless and prosper you, in your soul even, this releases God's spoken word into your life. And we know that God activates what you believe. So believe God because he wants you in abundance. His promises are yes and amen, but you have to believe them. You have to stand for them. You have to stand for them. Don't stop standing for them because they didn't come when you needed or the way you wanted and then find your own way to fulfill them because then you'll end up with an Ishmael in your life and you will end up train wrecked by that. Third, once you've made a firm foundation of faith, you stand on it by giving radically. Remember, it doesn't mean much to you if it isn't a great loss to you, if it's not going to really make any difference in giving, it won't mean much to God either because there was no sacrifice involved. If you're looking to really impact God and to really get his attention, you will sow something that you will never forget because you can't believe you actually did that. You might even think, I didn't even have that. I've talked to many that have done that. You will know if you've sown big because you will remember that you did that by faith, trusting God, but you will also know the impact of your choice to believe God for his promises. There's wise ways to manage finances. However, when you sow into God's economy, you sow to the level of your faith. And that means you believe God wants to prosper you. You believe God's blessing will come to you. And you're deciding to war against the economy of hell by becoming a giver. And after your decision is followed by action, then you can prepare for battle. When your faith rises and you give radically, your blessings begin working for you. Your life flows freely. This outpouring of blessing is going to bring persecution. The devil doesn't want you to have all these blessings. So when these blessings come, and again, remember, finances maybe are a part of that, but not guaranteed. Prepare yourself for challenges and trials. 
without your heart being prepared for that, the persecution is going to shock you. As you multiply and receive blessings, you can expect that people are going to be angry and the people that will be most angry are probably sitting in your church. The people with the spirit of mammon are the ones that are going to really take aim at you. This spirit is demonic, anti-prosperity, anti-blessing, and ultimately it powers the economy of hell. It will compel people with carnal minds to attack you, attack your increase, or just attack you, attack you, attack you, talk about you, slander you, attack you, say things about you, malign you, warn people to stay away from you. You must be prepared to be attacked by the kingdom of darkness when your increase comes. And that oftentimes will come from the side that you did not think it would come from. The other side, it wouldn't even bother you. But when it comes from fellow believers, it's, it's hard to adjust to that. We live in the service of two kingdoms. One is the kingdom of self, which revolves around us, our wants, pleasures, and desires. The other is a grander realm, the kingdom of selflessness, better known as the kingdom of God. And this kingdom revolves around the agenda of God, His will, His glory, only that. In this world, there's a constant war being fought within us between the kingdom of self and the kingdom of selflessness. And when we live for ourselves, our flesh, we have spiritual, emotional, and relational conflict and breakdown. And victory only comes in the kingdom of selflessness when we have singularity of heart and passion to serve God and serve others. So each one of us, we get to choose which kingdom are we in. God is waiting for us to pick a side because he's the one who said there's no middle. He hates the lukewarm. He wants us hot or cold. The lukewarm he despises because you kind of sort of do it, but not really. Your management of your time and your money is going to show accurately in the end which side you chose. And then eternity will be decided based on which side you actually chose. Precious Lord, you are clear. There's nothing about your expectations that are not clear. You are very clear. So people who are confused simply need to go to your word because you are very clear. Help us, God, to not get wrapped up in the economy of the devil and live for ourselves. I pray that you would hover over everyone that is convicted or needs to understand they are on the wrong path. They are actually part of the wrong kingdom. The devil's mission field is the church and the ministries. He already has those in the world. Help us to see whether we are actually missionaries for you, God, or if we were are a mission field thinking that we are working for you. Thank you, Holy Spirit, that you will do a great work in us and in those around us, that you will help us, God, to bring the greatest impact to your kingdom that we can, that you will give us everything we need to know on how you want us to do that. That is our heart's desire, God, to bless you every minute of every day. We just want to bless you, God. So help us, fill us, heal us, and give us all the courage we're going to need for the rest of this week and the days to come. And I ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.